a News 2 special presentation honoring black history, food from the soul, sponsored by your local Honda dealers and Bojangles. Hello, I'm Carolyn Murray. Thank you for joining us for Hidden History, Food from the Soul. In this special, we uncover the authentic culinary history of Southern food and the role the enslaved played in history. We bring you this report from Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. Historians say these cabins at Magnolia date back to the 1850s. The creator of the slave dwelling project, a descendant of enslaved people, says a big part of life for the enslaved was what they cooked and the way they cooked. The cooking traditions that define what we consider to be Southern food were brought to this country by enslaved Africans from West and Central Africa. The enslaved cooked outside, but when the weather was bad, they cooked on a hearth like you see here. When the weather did not allow them to cook outside, and they would use these spaces to not only warm the space, but also to cook the food that they would uh, consume. Joe McGill practices what he preaches, devoting his life to studying the way enslaved people were forced to live in America. He is the creator of the Slave Dwelling Project. McGill says he sleeps in preserved slave cabins so that enslaved people are remembered. The way they suffered, the way they lived, the contributions they made, like unwittingly bringing crops grown in Africa to American soil. Your collard greens, your, your black eyed peas, your yams. That's not what most of the enslaved who worked in the fields actually ate. If the enslaved were cooking for the masters, uh, they, of course, would not be in a, in a cabin like this. These are cabins for the field hands. The field hands' food was rationed. That weekly allowance of food would include a corn byproduct called mush, a fufu, and salt pork. He says some enslaved people were allowed a small plot to grow vegetables. They would grow their own gardens, or they could hunt and fish. Some were given a few small animals. That would mean a little more food for the enslaved person and less expense for the slave owner. The enslaver usually allowed them to own, uh, raise these chickens and pigs, knowing that if they did it for themselves, you know, that's, that was an expense that he did not have to, to incur. Life was hard for all who were enslaved, but it was different for those who were made to work in the kitchen of the slave owner. The differences in, in, in the food that would be consumed by people living in these slave cabins was much different than that food that would be consumed by those folks uh, w working and cooking for the people uh, in the big house. As we continue our chronicle of the roots of Southern cooking, we look at the ingredients that traveled across oceans and settled on America's table. The dishes started centuries ago with the enslaved and remain a part of the daily Southern diet. Gullah Geechee food is the passion of a chef who wants to uncover the truths of the history of what we eat and why. For more than a decade, Chef Kevin Mitchell has been there studying the stories of enslaved chefs cooks. and cooks. My research for my master's thesis talks about enslaved cooks from Charleston. The chief instructor yes. at the Culinary yes, Institute sir. of Charleston stirs emotions as he adds ingredients to this one-pot dish. Listen as he explains what enslaved people did to prove they were not eating their master's food. So there's, there's stories of um, this thing called the whistling walk, where enslaved would come from a main kitchen and they would be carrying food in their hand. And as they're carrying this food in their hand, they have to whistle. The whistling in the eyes of the slaveholder means that because you're whistling, you, you don't have the time or you can't eat my food. I had always been interested in like the history of African Americans and cooking and what they cook. What were some of the dishes they brought here that might be familiar to us? Hoppin' John, anything with okra, gumbo, and when you think of something like purlu, when everything is cooked in the same pot. Because as slaves, that's all you had. You had one pot. As Chef Mitchell rattles off names like of dishes that pull top dollar. Shrimp, shrimp and grits, you know, catfish stew. He is aware that this is what enslaved people cooked regularly for their slave owners. He says these were people caught in the 
pain of their servitude Not and the pride flavor, of preparing meals. Too. Chefs are doing that now and people are looking at it as if this this new thing as well and it's really not. Chef Mitchell says he hopes that by continuing to explore the history of Gullah Geechee cuisine, he will eventually locate descendants of enslaved chefs and cooks. I would like to maybe connect a living descendant to an ad and say, hey, this was your great, great, great grandfather. And help them learn the stories of how the power of food brought enslaved people and slaveholders unequally, but ultimately to the same table. Food traditions hold symbols and meaning that serve as a historical roadmap. When we come back, we look at the work that's being done to ensure that the contributions of the enslaved to America's culinary traditions isn't forgotten. The executive director of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor says the dishes enslaved Africans cooked are very similar to the meals still served up in many southern kitchens today. Heather Hodges says it is important to bring light to the uncredited ways the enslaved and their descendants have shaped how Americans eat. Slave cabins where they once lived, heavy cast iron pots they lugged around, and tiny gardens they planted. Remnants of enslaved people can easily be seen at Magnolia Plantation. Charleston, one of the reasons why Charleston became the home of the largest transatlantic slave market is because these plantations required a lot of people, and they required people that had very specific skills and knowledge, and those were the ancestors of the Gullah Geechee. Heather Hodges, executive director of the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor Commission, says the Gullah Geechee culture is hidden in plain sight. So the Gullah Geechee people are the descendants of West Africans who were trafficked from the rice coast to West Africa. Hodges says enslaved people who became chefs and cooks were central players in the birth of America's cultural heritage. And when rice became the major economic engine for South Carolina, the planters here were very much interested in obtaining the managerial and technical skills that those Africans had. So they were trafficked in most cases directly into Charleston. More than 10 million people came to this country through the transatlantic slave trade. She says if you walk into many homes and restaurants, more than 300 years later, you will see the same foods they brought to this soil. If you visit the home of someone who is Gullah Geechee, if you attend the celebration that's hosted by people who are Gullah Geechee, you're going to find a lot of rice. What you're going to see is a lot of seafood. You're going to see a lot of food that's in season because they're very much attuned to the growing cycles. When you see okra on a dish, when you see black-eyed peas on a dish, you're seeing Gullah Geechee food waste culture. It seems so many dishes are one-pot dishes. Here in the Low Country, you might hear them referred to as perlos, but that has long been a part of Gullah Geechee food waste, the idea of adding to rice, meat, vegetables, seafood, cooking it up in one pot, sharing it communally with friends, family, and neighbor. That's very much a part of, of Gullah Geechee food waste. It's about sharing heritage. It's about us sharing stories of who we are. Food is one way to connect to ancestors. When we return, we go into the kitchen with an award-winning chef who says adding your own ingredient to a classic dish makes the perfect blend. Gullah Geechee cuisine has been around since Africans first arrived in America. As our country changed, so have the dishes. I stopped by a local restaurant where you will see staples of Gullah Geechee styled food, rice and greens, peas and seafood. But an award-winning Southern chef says he uses his own imagination to add spice to his culinary creations. My fondest uh, memory. Nigel Drayton, owner and operator of Nigel's Good Food. My grandmother uh, waiting for her son to come down from Albany, New York. Reached way back for a memory of when he was about four years old. 
He was a chef and would wear chef uniforms and a big top hat, and he would come and uh, cook a uh, chicken chow mein. I was like so impressed because that's that was my first form of seeing someone in a uniform. Drayton connected to the idea. When did he start working? At the age of 15. Go back through your memory. Name some of the restaurants where you worked. Oh, Hyman's, Anson's, uh, South End Brewery and Smokehouse, 82 Queens, uh, Charleston Crab House, Charleston Crab House uh, Vickery's. I always felt the need to, to take on as much knowledge about the business as I could. And um, being creative and just not wanting to do the same thing over and over again. You know, our family comes from a line of businesses, so that's always been my mind. That's what we were supposed to do. Drayton and his wife Louise met while working in a restaurant, and soon they were recreating Low Country favorites. We have a Low Country ravioli. Uh, it has collard greens in it, it has black eyed peas, grilled chicken, uh, and a whiskey cream sauce. But it's what raviolis. Our food is family. It I is. Mean, it's you, definitely one of the main ingredients in a good time. That's the philosophy of Nigel's Good Food. Two very successful restaurants and a third one on the way. When creating our menu, we did not want to uh, specify one specific uh, type of person or uh, food just so one type of people can eat it. You know, we wanted to kind of diversify our menu so everybody can enjoy it. Nigel, continuing history, dishing up diverse low country cuisine. Soul food, there's no definition for it. You know it when you smell it and taste it. Too many cooks in a pot can spoil a meal, but once the spread is on the table, the message is dig in. Hidden history, food from the soul continues after a break. Fried chicken, collard greens, candy yams, these comforting classics are what instantly come to mind when you think of soul food. We went by the iconic pink building on Morrison Drive in Charleston and understood immediately why this is not called a restaurant. It is appropriately named Martha Lou's Kitchen. This your first time? You from here? Kanyas right here. and Binyas, right that's here? gala for newcomers and natives. Everyone's welcome in Martha Lou's Kitchen. This tiny pink building on Morrison Drive in downtown Charleston is a place where food is in arm's reach, just like in your own kitchen. Deborah Worthy. And I am Martha Lou's guest and daughter. Ruth! And her sister Ruth stir the pot at Martha Lou's Kitchen. Their mother, Martha Lou Gadsden, is the owner, operator, and head cook. She's 88 years old. She'll be 89 in March. So we just let her stay at home and we do this as, you know, as a team. They serve up belly filling food that follows no recipes. We do the collard greens, string beans, cabbage. And this right here is the llama beans. And this is the yams. Chicken, fish, and pork chop. We cook um, fish every day. Just like their famous fried chicken and fried fish, soul food is encrusted with the pride of creating something special out of something simple. Most people don't season their food, but we season our food. What does we that put mean just a, 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 a enough, just to season it to get the flavor to it. We don't over season it or under season it. Just put enough in there to get you over. What's and the secret this, to your tolerance? You know, you got to let it cook for at least a half an hour to 45 minutes, and you look at that water, and if that water dark green, pull that water off of them greens, because ain't nothing you can do with it. You can put 100 pounds of sugar in there. That collard greens ain't going to taste like nothing. Heather Hodges of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Commission says soul food is not Gullah Geechee food. Soul food is in a class by itself. 
when you think about the way that soul food is served and prepared in 2019, where we are now, you see a lot of fried preparation, deep fried preparation, food that is heavily battered. That's not traditional Gullah food ways. It's what people have come to love and expect from Martha Lou's Kitchen. Yeah, we had a lot of celebrities now. Bette Miller, we had. Sally Jesse Raphael. We had John Legend here. This is Reggie Jackson right here. Soul food, known for the taste and the hospitality that keeps you coming back for more. When we come back, connecting around the table when everyone has a different story to tell. Hidden history, food from the soul continues after this break. Something special happens when different people bring different ingredients together. Tina Singleton discovered through her creation of the transformation table that breaking bread often leads to breaking down barriers. When I came to Charleston two years ago, it was the first anniversary of the Mother Emanuel Massacre. And I had gone to an event at the Gilliard Center and Bernice King was speaking. If you're serious about change, you have to get intimate. And she said, you know, go to each other's homes, have dinner. And I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. I asked a friend of mine if she would be willing to, her and her husband would be willing to host, you know, eight strangers in their home for dinner. <laughs> she said yes. I really wanted the international, I wanted an international piece, an international component. Another friend of mine um, put me in touch with a woman who was from Vietnam, who makes incredible Vietnamese food. Very often we think about being around a table. Traditionally, it's with people whom we know best. Yes, I love being a curator. And I, I just kind of view it as curating a table, you know? And so bringing people from different backgrounds and different experiences, different life experiences, you know, people who are transplants, people who are, are native Charlestonians, you know, I think it's important that we bring all of these different people together so we can learn from each other. Just share a meal and share food and just tell stories and just get to know each other. Describe some of those transformation tables. We, we've done Afghanistan, we've done Italy, we've done um, uh, Morocco, Persian, Brazilian. We've done three different regions in India. We've done 13 different countries. How do you select who will be around the table? A lot of it is word of mouth. I also have a website where people can um, fill out a form that just says, tell me about yourself, you know, and looking at that, then it gives me an opportunity to curate the table in a way that brings um, different, uh, you know, different types of diversity to the table. And I just saw through that process, the power that food has in bringing people of diverse backgrounds together. You've witnessed how what happens around a table or in a pit like this one can open up dialogue around the impact of African-Americans on cooking and culture, past and present. We thank you for watching Hidden History, Food from the Soul. We leave you with this thought from historian Joe McGill of the Slave Dwelling Project. Because uh, we're not where we need to be is why it's still important to uh, convince others that telling the whole story of these uh, places is, is not a bad thing, it's a good thing.